All yours, Rob. Thank you. I'm Rob Menall, a member of Fauntleroy United Church of Christ in West Seattle. Um, thank you for joining us for this is the second uh, seminar uh, that we've called Exercise Your Power, Elections, Public Policy and Lobbying. As I said uh, last week, this series came about as a result of my increasing discomfort leading up to the last general election. Just before and just after the election, I voiced my frustration to Montlory Church's senior pastor, Leah Atkinson Belinsky. She politely challenged me to do something about my concerns. So after some period of reflection, I proposed three themes, uh, election security, how public policy is made, and the value of uh, the work of lobbyists. Pastor Leah, Associate Pastor Karen Fraser, and the Church's Christian Education Committee all felt that some learning on these topics could serve to build Jesus. trust or faith in our democratic form of government. Just gave it back. And further, uh, this information could be helpful when talking with anyone who wonders if their voice is actually being heard. Um, last Sunday, we talked with Dr. Nahid Aftab, uh, a King County election official, and she gave me at least great confidence that our mail-in voting system is absolutely secure. Um, now on to the next slide, Karen. This afternoon's session is public policy, how an idea becomes state law. Through this interview, I hope you will get a sense of the considerations and strategy involved in creating and passing legislation. Uh, before that, there are a couple of housekeeping things to take care of. One, Irene Stewart uh, will function as the host and will admit uh, audience members. Uh, two, we, will, we, we ask you to uh, add your name uh, to the uh, list of participants and at the same time, uh, stay uh, muted. Uh, we will probably handle questions uh, live at the end of the presentation. Um, and number four, uh, we are recording this session. So in the future, others can look at it. Uh, and last, um, it's our goal to achieve some understanding here, not debate. And we'll assume goodwill and respect for our guests as well as the members of the group. Uh, now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce today's special guest. Uh, she is Eileen Cody. Eileen's had three stellar careers. One is a group health Kaiser nurse specializing in rehab and multiple sclerosis. A second one as a member, as a founding member and officer of the Service Employees International Local Union. And that was followed by her third career uh, as a member of the State House of Representatives. Eileen retired this year after representing West Seattle for 28 years. And for two decades or more of that time, she chaired the House Healthcare Committee. And that's where I first encountered Madam Chair Cody, having testified in front of that committee many times. Since I retired 13 years ago, Eileen and I have become uh, better acquainted. We have many mutual friends but also um, because she championed legislation that I presented to her on behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation uh, probably three or four sessions ago now. Today, I count her as a friend. So Eileen, welcome, and thank you for joining us and particip participating. Uh, so on to my first question. Um, so when a constituent comes to you as a legislator with an idea for legislation, what are your major considerations in deciding to sponsor a bill or not to sponsor a bill? Well, uh, I'd say luckily, most of the time when I've had constituents bring issues, I have agreed with them, uh, their take on it, on things. They're, I can think of maybe one or two, one, probably only one occasion when I didn't in it. Uh, was somebody that was actually ran against me and then we talked about uh, <laughs> what their platform had been and I didn't necessarily agree. Wow. Uh, but so for the most part, it's looking at the issue, trying to figure out whether what can be done 
whether it's a global issue or whether it's individual, you know, if it's just something that's that's only affects that one person, you don't, don't want to turn those into bills necessarily because you got to have broad support when you're doing things. Uh, but I, well, I can think of uh, a constituent that had brought an issue about uh, they were emerging preparing for emergency. Uh, they were part of the ham operators that that are on the emergency management system. And uh, I worked with her to work on a bill. And it was actually something that was not going to be controversial. So I ended up handing that to a freshman because it was, and, and since it wouldn't go through my committee, it's also easier to hand things to people uh, when they're on the committee to have them then take care of it. So it's those, but you have to work on developing what the bill would look like and making sure that there's some support uh, outside of the 34th district, I'll phrase it that way. So th they're more global issues. So when you agree or you say you, you like the idea and that you would sponsor the legislation, how does it actually get turned into uh, a draft bill? Who, who, who does the writing? This, we have the staff because uh, and it's, I especially uh, am having worked with my staff pretty closely through the years, always wanted the staff to do the writing and they my staff always preferred that uh, instead of having the constituents writing things or, or interest groups, because uh, a lot of times they, it's the style of writing to try and make it fit in with the RCWs and uh, to make sure that, that like it doesn't conflict, that there aren't conflicting RCWs. And the RCWs are revised, re revised code of Washington. I should, shouldn't use all the abbreviations. Uh, and but that's normally I, I would ask the constituents to work with the staff, and that's how they it, with and I would be involved. But the but that's how we would develop things and get a bill written. And if it's a good group of people, then we try to get a uh, like I would try to get a Republican to be on board, you know, and, and see if they have uh have colleagues or uh you know other members of their group and other districts that they can talk to other people so when you say your staff who do you mean the committee staff or your committee staff. staff committee staff and could you describe that a bit please that it's nonpartisan staff uh that that actually they're having their uh 40th i think it was 40th anniversary it was now i can't remember how many years they told me they were just, they did this, this week, they celebrated an anniversary of how many years of, uh, I think it was 40 uh, years of having nonpartisan staff. Uh, and that's, you know, most of the states do have, have some, you know, the committee staff is nonpartisan. And then we have partisan staff that work for each of the caucuses that get assigned to the committees, but they're not, they're not who's drafting the bills or doing anything like that. They're just monitoring for the, the different caucuses. So uh, it, having it drafted by nonpartisan guarantees for everybody to know that there's, we're not trying to get shenanigans uh, to push things through. So that's, that's one of the reasons to have them drafted by the nonpartisan. And so in your instance, as a chair of that health and health care committee, you would ask somebody uh, on the staff of the committee. Uh, how many people are on that staff and are they spe do they specialize in some they, degree? They do. Uh, sometimes they get moved around, uh, but I actually had, well, one of the per people on my uh, committee has worked, worked for me for 20 years, over 20. So, so uh, definitely it was, and had come out of the Department of Health. He had, had uh, had worked over there and then came on to staff with us. So they have healthcare background or they end up developing a specialty in the area because, you know, the like the healthcare committee covers the professions and uh, of course hospitals, as you well know, uh, and, and then health insurance, which that's another kind of specialty for the, so they kind of divvied things up amongst the staff so that there would be somebody covering all the different areas. But, uh, and then the agency-wise, the Healthcare Authority, Department of Health, DSHS, uh, those all are, are we, we, we play with all of them, I'll just phrase it that way. 
And so they kind of also would divide up the agencies so that the, they would have a relationship with the different agencies. You didn't mention long-term care as one of the... Well, that's DSHS, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's long-term care, definitely. Um, explain a little bit more about the choices you make when you're looking for or encouraging um, additional co-sponsors for a piece of legislation. What's, what's the strategy behind that? Well, the ideal <laughs> is always to have uh, bipartisan sponsorship of legislation so that, that it, it will have, face less opposition, I guess. You're always looking, trying to make sure that you can yeah, increase support and decrease opposition. Um, I wouldn't say I'm always successful with that, but uh, there's some time, you, there's some issues you know are going to be a fight from the beginning. Uh, and then, but then there's a, most of them, most of the bills that pass the legislature are have support from both sides of the aisle. There's just the ones you hear about in the newspaper are, are the ones that are the fights. Uh, so that's the interesting thing. I mean, I, I haven't looked at the statistics lately, but I know that that through the years, most of the bills have some some support on both sides of the aisle. Huh? Yeah, I'd love some. <clears throat> um, how do you secure support for from other members uh, in the caucus? What's the process for exposing a piece of legislation that you're sponsoring to other members of your party, and, and who makes the decision? uh about whether the caucus is going to support or not well the, actually the caucus makes the decision uh but we do usually the, the house democrats we would have a retreat or you know a meeting before sessions uh usually after elections and um then so you'd know who was who was going to be in charge of the different committees that type of thing but we also would talk about what's the issues that everybody's hearing about, what's the, the big topic, the, especially during election years, what, was, what were you hearing on the doorstep? You know, what were people talking about? What's the things that, are, that people are concerned about that we need to make sure we address? And like I'm, this year, as you, housing was of course a big topic. And so, uh, and you know, like if we're thinking back after the Affordable Care Act, of course, passed, that was, for healthcare, that was the big issue was how we were going to implement the Affordable Care Act in the state. Uh, so how we do it is have discussions. I mean, basically use the chairs will make some presentations about the topic and get a feel for where the where the caucus is. Um, when actually I'll use when we passed the bill on the public option, that was after the last, I'm trying to think what it was. Like it, it was after the, I guess it was 16, because it was a presidential election year. And I remember I stood up in caucus and I said, okay, how many people here, you know, think like the idea of Medicare for all? And of course, that, that was a big topic at the time. And uh, they people raised their hand and I said, well, okay, then I'm going to work on giving you a bill that's as close to we, what we can get for Medicare for all in the state of Washington, which was the public option idea. And uh, so everybody was excited about that idea, and I never had any problem with that. That they knew that was the goal, and so I knew I had the support of the caucus uh, in moving forward. So that that's kind of an example of you. You have the discussions um, going back 20 years or so when the individual market failed in the state. And the insurers stopped selling in the individual market and people couldn't even buy insurance if they wanted it. That uh, was probably one of the worst uh, issues that I had to deal with. I was a young, young chair at that time. It was actually, we were in the tie. And, uh, the, and if you remember back in some of those darker days, um, healthcare reform that had passed in 93, which I know you were, you were involved with, Rob, that uh, a lot of the Democrats had blamed the losses that they took in 94 on healthcare reform, that they had passed it. So people were pretty skittish about what was happening and not wanting to vote on things. 
Uh, so I knew we had to get something done about uh, the individual market. And I knew that, uh, that no matter what, that people wanted something, no matter whether if I thought it was bad or not. So I had to work on it to get it to the point where I liked it, but I was still unhappy because of, I felt like it wasn't good for consumers, but it was, it was what we had to do to be able to get the insurers back into the market. And uh, so I remember people thanking me and I was very upset. This is, I was a young chair, started crying because I hated the bill so much, but I knew I was <laughs> voting for it. <laughs> so, you know, there's times that you do things that, you, that for the good of the state and the good of the population, but not, that, not the direction that you necessarily want, uh, want things to go. But I stuck around long enough to get some of that changed. <laughs> So does the Speaker of the House ever put his or her finger on the scale and say, this is what I want to see happen or influence whether the caucus says yes or no? Um, well, some influence. I mean, this, of course, the Speaker has some influence, but uh, it also depends on the expertise of the individuals. Like Because I was a nurse and, and into healthcare policy, Neither one of the speakers that I've worked with really ever gave me much grief. Uh, it's if it's somebody that isn't as deep into the policy in that or a new chair just starting to learn, then they might get influenced a little bit more. But uh, it really depends on the individuals that are working on the topic. And, and I have seen it when actually I can think of a couple times when the speaker wanted something to go a direction. And the caucus was split. And we always had an agreement that if at least 50% of the caucus has to support something for us to move forward. So uh, that, that was always uh, one of our rules. Um, backing up a little bit, uh, when you have a bill drafted um, and it's ready to go, who decides what committee it goes to? The uh, majority leader that they review the, and at, well, I should, actually I'll have to back up. First of all, we have a group called, that's committee on committees when, when every two years when the, the house reorganizes, decides what, who the chairs on the, are gonna be for the committees and kind of decides what the committees will be, first of all, and then the jurisdictions of the committees. So different things get moved into the committees um, as an example, the healthcare, we, we would get a lot of bills. We were always this judiciary is number one and healthcare is number two in policy committees about how, how many bills come through. And so they were all, they worry about how, how much work the staff, the different staffs have to do. So we try and balance things out when it gets out of whack. Um, and so this year they moved some of the policy stuff that was on scope of crack, and not really scope, but uh, professions into higher ed rather than having it go to healthcare. So that, that's an example. Uh, years ago, we moved behavioral health, used to be in human services, the, the mental health stuff. And they, we moved that into healthcare because we wanted to make it clear that mental health, behavioral health was part of healthcare and it shouldn't be treated separately. So that was, oh, golly, I bet that was 20 years ago that we did that. But, you know, it's those type of things that you make, they make changes. So then after the Committee on Committees gets the jurisdictions decided, then it's the majority leader with, along with, you know, the lawyer for the speaker. They review the bills and decide, it's, but the majority leader has the last word as to where bills are assigned. And sometimes they, you know, they'll make a mistake or, or they didn't realize that there was a plan to have it go through another committee and we will have them re-referred. Or sometimes if you, if they want to kill a bill, they have it re-referred so that it's uh, taking extra effort to get it moved forward. So that's, that happens in the, actually, if, uh, when we would have a lot of bills in healthcare, if it was a, a po not very much policy but uh, a lot of money in the bill, then I would ask to have it go to appropriations so we didn't have to uh, take the time with it because it was gonna have to go there anyway. Well, I thank you for that because I just learned something. I always thought it was the code revisor's office that made the decision of what, no, which, what no. committee it went That's, to. No, majority leader. 
I just thought we'd, we dropped a bill in the hopper and it came out and it was assigned to a committee. All right. <laughs> uh, you uh, mentioned referring bills to a freshman uh, legislator. Um, expand a little bit on what the rationale is behind that. Why would you do that? Well, you want them to learn the process of how to get a bill through, through the whole legislature. You want them to have, as a freshman, you want them to have some success. And uh, so, especially if I have freshmen on my committee, I would pick bills to have them, you know, as the chair, everybody wants you to sponsor their bill. Well, I'm, you know, no, <laughs> you can't do that. Uh, so mm -hmm. I would usually take the ones that would be either something that I was invested in and wanted to see happen, or that would might end up being a little more controversial or needed work. So uh, what I try to do, a lot of the agency request legislation is not controversial and, and is an easy learning curve for people. So that those are ones that I would always try and give. And I, when I say give them to a freshman. I at, would ask the freshman to be the prime sponsor and then tell them that they needed to go talk to a Republican, you know, who I thought in the Republicans that would be supportive of it so that they would learn to work across the aisle with uh, individuals and, and to find out who was, who was interested in topics. So it's a learning opportunity. Does it also have a political benefit in uh, sure. oh, yeah. uh, the next freshman, election cycle? Right. You want freshmen to, to have some bills to, to be able to point to what they have accomplished. So uh, yes. And uh, you know, actually, I also would try and give bills to the Republicans, especially, you know, if, if I, most of the time, if they're in safe districts, there was no reason not to give them a bill to have them take, be able to take, because the Demo you know, if I knew a Democrat was never gonna win in the district, I didn't have any problems with giving a bill to a Republican to have them start. And it may, that makes for goodwill across the aisle. I'll just right. phrase it that way. Um, is it unusual or usual for a bill to take more than two sessions, more than one session to become law? Oh, it's pretty usual. There, it, I mean, there's, there's, as I said, if it's agency request that or a governor request, those are, those are usually have a little more clout behind them, uh, and are easier to get through. But, well, I, I, I as an example, I think I saw in the paper today they're finally passing the uh, state dinosaur which we get bills like that from kids, you know, the different classes will come forward with ideas. The state dinosaur bill has been around at least five years, I think, four or five years. So, which is, you, you know, that kind of, you think, why are they wasting their time with that kind of stuff? But it's, it's also a civics lesson for kids. So we've done, you know, I don't know whether we ever passed the state candy because that was a turned into a controversy between almond roca and uh, <laughs> applets and cutlets. Uh, so I, I don't remember whether that ever passed or not. But East it, versus West. Yep, that's right. That's exactly right. And then we have you know state fossil. Uh, so there, there's that type of things that that go well. Pickleball. My husband claims to have helping get the pickleball through because since I was retiring. Uh, he and of course he knows the speaker well, and because she was on healthcare for a long time, so uh, he had called me and said, "Where's the pickleball bill? Why isn't it moving?" And so I went in and said, "You know," he told her, told me to tell her that he hadn't asked for anything in 28 years, and this was what he wanted was the pickleball <laughs> bill. And so they they ran it the next to the last bill last year. So he get he claims that he helped. <laughs> Oh. Extra, extra marital lobby. That's right. That's right. Or something like that. Um, what's a hero bill? Oh, a hero bill. Well, those are yeah, that's somewhat the, the talking about pickleball. Um, it, <laughs> hero bills are usually something that uh, out of a district, and it's it's usually uh, specifically for an area or for a group. And they're usually pretty easy uh, and that it will help people in their uh, getting reelected, that type of thing is, a, is usually what we think of as hero bills. Uh, the other thing that people do a lot is naming bills, which drives me crazy. I, I wouldn't let a bill out of my committee if it had a name on it. I hated that. 
because it's a manipulative thing that group that groups will do or you know the parents are coming down about some tragedy you can see i it's like and i just feel it's manipulative when you name things after an individual i i wanted policy to stand on its own uh uh they the one bill i ended up i was spot ricky's law which i was the sponsor for uh the advocate for it kept wanting to name it Ricky's Law. And I wouldn't do it in the house. It went the out of the house. And then she wanted got the Senate to do it and I and asked if it was all right. And I said, I won't kill it if it's, you know, if you do it in the Senate, but I'm not doing it in the House. So that's what happened was the Senate amended it with the name and it ended up. So yes, and that's the one bill that I have had a name on it that I sponsored. <laughs> so could a hero bill also be one that's introduced to uh I don't know, uh, curry favor with a neighbor, but with no hopes of it's ever going to be yes, passed. without ever passing, yes. That some, but that's, you can a, say, that's another uh, style of hero bills. Legislator could say, yeah, I introduced that bill. Oh, yeah, I tried. Uh, but, yeah, but they they know it's not going to go anywhere. Yes, there are. That's another style. Um, so will a bill have a greater, there are probably many answers to this question. Uh, will a bill have greater chances of success if there's a lobbyist uh, or a, an established organization working to get it passed versus one that's uh, on behalf of an individual uh, or a small oh, yeah. organization? Well, no lobbyist. If there's no lobbyist on, uh, on the issue, it is hard because then it's up to the legislator to have to track it, to do the lobbying, to, you know, what, talking to individuals. Uh, and yeah. That, and that's not easy because of course, especially when it goes over to the Senate or like for the house, the opposite house, you don't have a clue uh, if you, if there's not somebody else over there working it. So that it is difficult. I'm trying to, I had one bill and I can't remember what it was now. That was, there wasn't an interest group that I had worked on and, and it was very hard <laughs> to get, to know what was going on. So yes. Definitely, you want to uh, identify groups that would support an issue so that there's a lobbyist behind it to be able to help monitor it and to see what's happening. And because uh, there's so many different steps uh, before a bill becomes a law uh, that I yeah, people I don't think you know they realize. Besides, it has to go through a committee. Sometimes it's two committees. Well, for sure, it goes actually rules committee also. So you go through a policy committee, might go through appropriations or ways and means, then it has to go to rules, has to get pulled onto the calendar. You have to get the speaker to pull it up uh, uh, on the floor so that they do as a vote. And then it goes over to the Senate and does the exact same thing. So uh, it's a miracle sometimes you you think that anything mm -hmm. passes. <laughs> so and that's what the problem in DC is. <laughs> lobbyists can uh, function as a bird dog or somebody persistently following a bill or Taking, or just, trying to get the next step prepared. Because things can just kind of fall by the wayside, not necessarily on purpose, but just not, you know, if they, if you're not, if somebody's not saying, oh, what about this issue? Uh, yeah, it can, they can get lost. Actually, I've heard the story of a bill that uh, on this, I think this was right before I got elected, but, you know, there's paper that goes back and forth, which people think that it's kind of crazy when you think about the paper, but, uh, and at one point, this, a bill had passed, but the paperwork dropped behind somebody's desk, and they didn't find it in time to get signed by the speaker and the, the Senate leader. So it, it ended up, even though it had passed, it did not get to the governor's desk, just by clerical mistake. I don't even know what I don't know what the bill was, but I know it was before I was there. But I'd heard the story, so that's why you learn to keep an eye on things and make sure that that they moved along. The people who wanted that bill probably remember the details. Yeah, I'm sure they did. <laughs> so um, I've got one more question for so for those of you in the audience uh, who have questions, or, uh, start thinking about how you're going to put that question forward because we're going to turn it to you in a moment. Um, just uh, summarize how many bills typically pass in a legislative session. Do you remember the statistics? Um, I think it's usually 
most, maybe 300, three to four. There's usually 2,000 introduced and uh, usually three to 400, I think, pass. Yeah. I know that they, I could, well, I, as I said, I was down, I had a meeting down there on Wednesday and the, one of the lobbyists told me that they could, they had done their calculations and they had passed more bills this year than the average. Um, I read that in the paper a few days ago. Yeah. <clears throat> so that uh, if 15% um, of the bills that are introduced pass, that's a pretty significant volume. Um, and if it is increased this year, would that be because both the House and the Senate and the governors are all in the same party? Uh, yes, or does that, that make a difference? Well, we've had that. We've had the same party before, too. Uh, but yeah, it makes a difference. And uh, well, specifically, I can say part of it is that the Senate Democrats are um, are a little more liberal. Let's see. The, some of the people that left were more conservative, so they don't have uh, they they they're all they're more con congealed, I guess I'd say. They're all more on the same page on things. So that's uh, I think made a big difference for the the House. Is there's so many of us. Uh, you know, when the, when you have 98 people in the House, that you can have more. You know, in the well, let's see how many the House. The majority right now in the House is 56, I think. So you can lose six votes. The Senate is always much tighter than the House has been. Um, and don't ask me to explain that, but it, it has been. Uh, so they they usually can't lose very many votes. So that that has made a difference for, for them. All right, you can raise your hand uh, electronically or just raise it physically and anybody would like to ask another question, go ahead. Irene? No, who's up next? Go ahead, Lucy. You're muted. Uh, um, when was the last time the Republicans ever had a majority in this in this legislature? They haven't had the majority in the House. Well, actually, boy, I don't even know when the last time they had both. I think it was 80-something when uh Spelman, Evans, wasn't it when during Spellman administration or was it, it was before Spell, that yeah when was it Spellman that called them Neanderthals when they were it was something about trying to get the subject <laughs> out he was mad he got mad at his own part yeah I think it was Spellman uh so but the House Republicans actually wait a minute I take it back they both they were in charge the the uh lock the first two years of the lock administration um because this, because I was in the minority, my first four years I was in the minority. So 95, 96, the Senate was de Democrat, but the House was Republican, and we were so far in the minority. It, we, there were only 38 Democrats that, uh, and I remember my freshman year asking uh, one of the uh, another Republican freshman about something, and she told me, "We don't care what you think; we don't have to," which. Mm. Uh, in, impressed upon me that that wasn't the way to win friends and influence enemies for the future. Uh, just phrase it that way. But uh, the then it would have been 97, 98. The, yeah, that was the Republicans were in charge, of both the House and the Senate, because that's what the year that the the Locke uh, did so many vetoes and was uh, he was the master. Everybody gave him the credit of being a master with a veto. Uh, after that that year so that's that's the last time and then so the house is we had the house was tied then for three years and then the democrats have been in charge since then so so night let's see i always have to go to, to, since 2002 thanks who's next um eileen you mentioned 40 years that you've had nonpartisan staff. So I was thinking back, that would be what, 1983. And I recall that the house was tied in uh, 81 and 82. Yeah, that's right. So was that an outcome, do you think, of having- It might have been, I, you know, I don't, I'll have to- It might've been the first time they were ever tied. I'd remember they were truly trying to figure things out and I worked down there at that time. 
Right. It that was the first time they were tied, I think. Yeah. I'm sh I'm pretty sure that we were the only the second time in state history mm -hmm. when when do you want to ask? So, yeah. I and I actually that probably is when the nonpartisan staff came about. Yeah. But I'll have to ask one of my former staff people if that was the case, because I don't, I mean, you know, it was always that way was for me, so I never worried about it. Yeah. Let's hey, see. Dennis? Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps it's a better question for next week, but uh, you mentioned lobbyists, and I maybe I just have uh, a, by a, a, a wrong impression of lobbyists because they have a negative connotation, but evidently lobbyists are advocates for different things. I'd like to hear from the perspective of the legislature what what do they what purpose are they serving for you? Well, a, the, a good lobbyist is there to educate you on a topic. And uh, actually the really good lobbyists will say, okay, this is the pro and this is the con. And they know who's gonna be opposed and will tell you who is opposed. Uh, and, and they're truthful. If you catch a lobbyist lying about something, um, they get banned from your office. That's, I, I only had one that I banned permanently. Uh, that lied about something and lied about me. And so that was the end of that. Uh, and so that that's, if you talk, and I'm sure Susie next week will talk about this and Rob can too. It's that's their, their reputation is based on telling the truth. And so uh, they, it, it's not in their best interest to lie about something. So, but they really have to be, know the topic and be able to educate on the topic and now, when they leave, then there's some lobbyists that leave things out that uh, you learn that also, but that, uh, omission is not exactly the same. Uh, it's a sin of omission, I guess, but, but it's not the, uh, not as, not, it doesn't get you as upset about lying about something. That, I guess I'll phrase it that way. But the, no, the lobby, there's, I mean, when you think about lobbyists, Yes, they have. There's always a negative connotation that comes with it, be just because I think that I don't know why it certainly has moved that way more and more. But there's also the the uh, lobbying for the patients. We have patient advocates that lobby specifically on different disease groups. Uh, there are, you know, so we, we call them white hat lobbyists. That's the the other thing that we refer to some. And the ones that are all, uh, let's see, the other group that we call the oilies, that all of the, the, the oil and gas uh, lobbyists are the oilies. So, you know, they, they, you, you do classify people into different groups, but uh, that it, it all, they, they all have a purpose and they really do, ed, are there to educate, not, not to try and gum up the works. <laughs> That well, not always. <laughs> we'll go into that in, in greater detail next week, Dennis. And, um, and Lucy, Lucy has her hand up. Uh, actually, yeah, it's Terry. Yeah. It's Terry. Oh, Terry. Um, I, I've heard of uh, some uh, some states that have taken uh, verbatim, like especially for gun control, right off of. Uh, the uh, organization, you could see the same words in the bill. To what extent is that happening in the state of Washington? Do you see organization uh, bill or what they've written up in their organization uh, in, a, uh, in, in, in the bill itself when it comes before Congress? Uh not I that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier in yeah time about having the staff the nonpartisan staff drafting the bills by doing having this nonpartisan staff draft things you don't get in you won't see that so I don't think that we in Washington okay. have a lot have much of that. so all bills are drafted by nonpartisan staff not all uh, all through that's it's uh but we try to get them draft it's the staff much prefers to have them drafted by this their themselves because yeah. they end up having to clean up things 
when it comes through the committee and it's more work for them if they didn't draft it originally. So uh, it's, how did I, the good, uh, a, a good chair understands that and makes sure of it. The newer ones may not know it. And so they don't force the issue as much, but uh, like I always made, all stuff go through the, the committee as much, the committee staff as much as possible. If I knew about a bill being drafted, I would say talk to so and so so that they uh, make sure you can, you don't have to, the code revisor will, will draft bill. I mean, people can write up a bill and basically give it to the code revisor and ask them to, to draft the bill. Some lobbyists do that, but uh, that's not the code revisor, is, that's not their best, their, not their skill necessarily. Because they have, they're just reviewing all of the, all of the RCWs when things come in, and they may not be the person that knows the most about that, that topic area. So I could, I could offer something else on that. I, the hospital association would have our legal counsel sometimes draft legislation, uh, and the, the attorneys were very competent, um, but we would also understand that our draft didn't have to be the final version. There are gonna be amendments along the way or people who have in, improvements that were uh, worthwhile incorporating. And I think um, I remember there were boilerplate bills that were introduced from time to time. The conservative organization called ALEC is one that's been known to do that around yeah. the country. And generally speaking, if I rem remember this right, those boilerplate bills didn't get very far in the Washington state legislature. They didn't have that much respect. Right. Now there are other, there are some bills along that when you say boilerplate, there's, um, oh golly, it's years ago, there was a pub change on public health that they to modernize public health laws across the country that was pushed by uh, the uh, national public health uh, groups. And, we, you know, that happened and we managed to get most of that taken care of. And thank God we did because it helped get for COVID. It was like the emergency powers and that type of stuff. Um, and then the other thing that is somewhat boilerplate is now with the compacts for healthcare professionals, uh, they, to, to be able to have a license in one state and be able to move around using the one license, that's what these compacts and it's compacts between the states and for those to, they're drafted, the language of the bill is drafted by the organizations, like physical therapist was the first one that was passed in Washington <laughs> state. And the, then you have to, each state has to pass the exact same thing for the compact to be valid. So there's some things like that, but the, even those have, are not easy to get passed necessarily, so. How many people are involved in that process of rewriting the, the kind of the, is that a big group or a small well, the, group? Well, the staff on each committee, there's usually, depending on the size of the committee and how many bills come through it, there's at least two, if not three or four uh, oh. on each committee. Oh. And so then that they would be who, who and you know, like they're the ones going to be responsible for any amendments and making sure that the bill makes sense and that they don't screw up. Then the things go through the code revisor's office to try and they to make sure that they're, that's supposed to be the second set of eyes to try and just for legality wise, uh, not so much as to what the policy is. So they draft them. And then every year there's a, a bill that comes, this is an easy bill that comes through the freshman usually gets that's correcting double references because if like if a bill passes uh regarding oh I, I'll, insulin i'll use that one because we had the same exact same bill pass the house version and the senate version and the house house person was a republican and the senate person was a democrat and we couldn't get them to agree whose bill it should be mm. uh and so we uh we passed we made sure on that one that the bills were exactly the same so that they could both be, could be claimed as the bill. But then other times you'll have the same topic in two different bills and the, they may be amending the same part of the RCW and that's when the code revisor has to take care of it. But sometimes it ends up like double references is what they call it. 
And so you'll have a bill that's just cleaning up the RCWs, which is not supposed to be anything that has any policy changes in it. It's just trying to get the languages of the, uh, the code lined up. So if a bill passes both the House and the Senate and it goes to the governor's desk and the governor signs it, then what happens? If it's exactly the same, you mean? Uh, the bills, the the bills are the same. No, no uh, controversy. They're passed, and they're, the governor signs it. What are the what what is done in implementing the bill? Who's involved? Uh, well, if they usually they try and catch it before the governor. If there's a conflict, because the governor's office has a. No, I don't. I don't mean that, Eileen. Just a straightforward bill. It's not. not oh, oh controversy. just a regular bill, not a con okay. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, well, then it goes to the agency that is directed to whatever it's supposed to, you know, whatever the bill is about. There's usually an agency that is uh, has to implement. So it that's that's where the next step is after it's passed. And that after can time. that can lead to uh, a prolonged rule writing process, for example, with yes. opinions for and against and, and challenges on language and that sort of thing. <laughs> Nothing happens quickly, really. I have a question as an old open government person. Uh, why is there so much controversy about the legislature not being completely open or, you know, sunshine laws? And there was, or maybe it's just the Seattle Times that disagrees with what's going on. <laughs> but can you explain what the state of that is? Uh, well, how should I phrase this? Um, for years, the legislature had held that we were not part, you know, that there was not as, I can't even remember which parts that they said we didn't have to, to disclose. And then they find, you know, there was a lawsuit and they lost that. I will say uh, some of the old time lawyers that worked for the legislature really tried to fight it more most of the members don't care that much, <laughs> I will say, but uh, it's, but it, there is a difficulty in the fact that of what gets, um, would be out because of the fact that we're trying, you know, you have to try and work together and get things done. And like the, anything that's done in our caucus is supposed to be exempt from, it's like the, what you can speak freely, that's what we're supposed to be able to do in caucus so that that's when we try and hash out things. And, and of course, it's, there's not much in writing in there, but still, uh, I, I mean, I'm sure that there's some of the open government people think there shouldn't be allowed to have caucuses. Um, but that's, that, that's where the fights kind of come from. And then the other part of it is that there's, uh, there are some people, I can think of a few of the choice characters, who that's all they do is they put in uh, information requests and then they're looking, they're trolling basically to try and sue the government about something. And we've had a lot of cases where there's, there's a couple of guys that hang out in Olympia that that's what they do is they come and uh, try and follow something that's, that they think would be controversial. And then they get in, they'll do information requests and then they try and you know sue the state for some money. I don't know that they get large amounts, but if you do it often enough and get a little bit, uh, it still adds up to some cash. So that's where the, some of the conflict about it, the, it's not really the press, although the press gets so cranky about it. And, it's, and the other thing is like some of the small cities have really complained because they have people that get cranky with them and then they do huge information requests. And it takes a lot of work to go through to supply mm -hmm. some of these yeah. information requests. And it's it has caused problems for some of the smaller jurisdictions to whether they have the resources to meet all of the requests. So it's not an easy topic. I'll just phrase it that way. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Over your uh, 28 years in the House, did um, the, the body become more partisan? Yes, definitely. How did that uh, affect how you worked? Well, 
since I mean, since I had been around as long as I had been, it, it didn't bother me as much. Although it, it definitely became more partisan. Um, oh golly, in the because we used to go out together. The, um, you know, there we had karaoke. I'm sure Rob, you were. I'm sure they were doing karaoke when you were down there. Uh, they we'd go out. Uh, there was would be one night a week that everybody would go out for beer and have and sing karaoke. And you haven't lived till you've seen some of the members of the legislature sing because <laughs> we're not very good. Uh, but but it was a chance not only to talk to one another across that you know across the aisle but also the house and the senate because it was both part both groups would go out and that we they aren't doing that anymore um we also the rule that about not the this will this is one that's interesting every um lobby is taking people out to dinner and that used to be common that you would have you know maybe the i would go out with the head of the you know my republican counterpart and then the Senate, we'd have the equal Senate people and you'd have discuss topics and not that you necessarily would agree on things, but you would at least be out and seeing each other and get to know one another outside of the legislature. And now we have a rule that you can only have uh, 12 dinners a year and, and except 12 meals. And that was because we had a legislator that went, was living with one of the oilies, I'll just phrase it, <laughs> and went out to dinner every night and charged it on his account. It was like over, I don't know how many, thousands of dollars worth of meals from the same person. And so then everybody gets punished by this. And and this that I rule, I think, has hurt, um, hurt the legislature a lot because you really are not developing the relationships that we would when you, you know, breaking bread with somebody else it actually is a, a good way to get to know people in a more relaxed uh, area. And that's gone now. And, and so it's that, that I think, and it's, and then what's funny is most of the, uh, the members, we didn't necessarily complain about it at the beginning because it's not like we wanted to necessarily go out to dinner with the lobbyists all the time, but it was part of the job and you got to go with other people. So uh, now it's hardly anybody is going out. It actually, it, I'm sure it hurt the restaurant industry in, in uh, Olympia too, <laughs> but uh, that that has been a big big change. And I can't remember how many years now it's been. Probably six, eight, maybe eight years. I can't remember when it happened. A while ago. Irene had her hand has her hand up, and then Dennis, I think, has a question. Actually, Dennis can go first. Well, you talk about the aisle. Uh, what is the, you know, why did they have to have sides of the aisle? I could just sit in alphabetical order or something. Maybe people would get to know each other. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, it's funny that you'd say that because actually as when, when our majority gets bigger, like right now, there are a lot of Democrats that would be, we would have to sit on the Republican side. And uh, people, they do pick out who will, you know, the assignments of where you sit are made by the whip. That's who, and our, and our office assignments are made by the whip. So uh, it's, it is not, we don't get to decide that necessarily. Now you can, we can lobby him with the big Joe, Joe McDermott was the whip or not. No, he was, I guess he wasn't the whip then. It was, he was, but he was in charge of it. For some reason, they, whoever the whip was gave it to him to do. And he used to joke about which, uh, that he liked Jameson's if they, if you wanted an office. And strangely enough, no one ever gave him any Jamesons, but that was a sign that he would tell people. So uh, it, but the, yeah, we don't, we it, they keep them separate. I think it's just tradition because we do it in committee. It's like basically Republicans sit on one side, Democrats sit on the other. So, so that's it, the aisle is part of the world, I guess. Irene. Um. Well, just a, a side note to Dennis, you'll find the same thing in Parliament. And if you go up to Victoria and the aisle is exactly the width of two swords so that um, they couldn't kill each other. So um, anyway, um, 
Eileen, it's always so great to see you. And I'm just wondering, um, are you working on any issues now that you are retired from the legislature because you still have an amazing amount of clout and influence? And so I'm, I'm wondering if you're using it for good. <laughs> or, or evil. Uh, I'm on the Healthcare Cost Transparency Board, which was a board that I, I sponsored the legislation on. Uh, Rob may not agree with me. The Hospital Association hated the, the bill, <laughs> but I won anyway. Uh, and uh, so I'm on that and we'll see how things go there. And I, I may end up on the Harborview Board. Wonderful. So, uh, those are the things at this stage of the game. And Let me see, I'll, that would be Joe McDermott appointing you to the Harborview Board, correct? Yeah, my name's already <laughs> gone for, no, no, Dow has to do the, the uh, right oh, now Dow does it. Okay. Yeah. But it's yeah. okay. Yeah. I I know. We'll see whether Dow is... probably nominated you. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what happened. <laughs> yes. So well, that's great. Yeah, there's a problem with Barry said that's what it's West Seattle nepotism. Since yes. Dow Constantine is from West Seattle also. That's right. That's okay. It's not, yes. it's not more like more. when Nichols was around, we had the West Seattle Mafia running things. So, hey, oh, yeah. some of us, no, never mind. <laughs> Most of us weren't living in Seattle at that time. Uh -oh. oh, that's not true. <laughs> I bet it Some is. of us were here. Lucy and Irene and I were for sure. Yeah. If there are no more questions, we'll, Nothing we'll, in the chat. <laughs> we'll wind this down. Uh, thank you, Eileen, for participating and giving us the spontaneous, uh, honest answers. Um, yes, oh, thank you. A lot of fun. Um, yeah. So I want to remind you that next week we're going to do the last in the series. Um, and the topic for next week is going to build on Dennis's questions. And uh, the title of the presentation that I started with actually many years ago, but I think it still works is Lobbyist is not a four letter word. And um, I think that I will try to uh, help people understand that uh, lobbyists can do a lot of positive things. And in our government, if we didn't have lobbyists, we'd have to invent them. <laughs> so with that, thank you again for participating <laughs> and I hope to see you next week. All right, thanks. Thanks, Eileen. Love, thank peace, you. and happiness. Thanks, Eileen. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, Bye. thanks. Thank you.